Well, it finally happened. I got a math paper published. And I discovered not one, not two, not three or four, but more than 10 new kinds of polyhedra. But I don't even have a math degree, so how did I end up here? Well, the journey is just as interesting as these new shapes. A while ago, I made a video about neighborly polyhedra, and I got really close to finding a solution. But the closest I could get was this cool razor cross shape. After that video, Dr. Jurgen Bukowski, a mathematician I instantly recognized from my research on that last video, reached out to me. He suggested that the method I used in that video might be able to find solutions to a related open problem, finding embeddings of regular maps. But what are regular maps? Maybe you're already familiar with the regular polyhedra, or platonic solids. But what makes them regular? Is it that all the faces have identical regular polygons? Well, it can't be just that, because otherwise this shape would be a platonic solid. The reason it's not regular is that the vertex connections need to also all be the same. Like here, four triangles meet at a vertex, but here only three triangles meet. The more rigorous way to say it is that the shape has to be flag transitive. That is, every connected vertex, edge, and face should be identical to any other one by symmetry. Now that still leaves the Kepler-Poisson polyhedra, they still meet both other requirements, so they are regular. But they're typically not considered polyhedra because the faces self-intersect. I mean, they are really cool, but once you add this last rule, you get exactly the five platonic solids. But what if we were to relax the first constraint? These would be polyhedra that are combinatorially regular, meaning every face is indistinguishable given only a map of how everything is connected. Similar to the way a topologist wouldn't be able to tell the difference between a donut and a coffee cup. Are there more polyhedra like this that exist? The answer is yes. Think of an infinite square grid. You could say this is regular because it has all identical squares and exactly four of them meet at each vertex. But because it's infinite, it's not a closed polyhedron. But there is an easy way to fix that. We can take a subset, let's say these 16 faces, and use that as a repeating pattern. It still looks infinite, but what we're really saying is that this face and this face are actually the same face. So let's connect them that way to make a polyhedron. This side just needs to connect to this side, and this one to the other side. Let's try it and see what happens. Hey, wait a minute, that's just a donut. And it's combinatorially regular. All the faces have four sides, and all the vertices connect four faces. Any repeated tiling on a flat plane like this will end up with a hole once we connect it together. So its genus, or number of holes, will be one. This is different from the spherical tilings, which have genus zero, since they're topologically spheres. And maybe you see where I'm going with this. There's one more type of regular tiling, hyperbolic tilings. If you've played my game Hyperbolica or watched the devlogs, you'll know what I'm talking about. But to quickly summarize, we could cram more faces around each vertex than a Euclidean flat tiling. For example, seven triangles around a vertex instead of six. And yes, just like planar tilings, hyperbolic tilings can also have repeated patterns, like this klein quarktic. I can visualize that here in Hyperrogue. You'll see that the triangle patterns are repeating as I walk around. The difference is, folding up a hyperbolic tiling is more complicated. The extra curvature means you end up with more than one hole. And just like the platonic solids, there's only a finite number of hyperbolic regular maps for each genus. These edge graphs are what we call the regular maps. But they're not polyhedra yet, 
they're abstract. But if we can make them into actual polyhedra from our definition, then we've found what's called an embedding. Since these maps already satisfy this condition, it's the last condition that makes things difficult. For reasons I'll get into later, let's just focus on regular maps of triangles for now. There were only five known polyhedral embeddings for these triangular maps. While you watch these animations, I just want to quickly explain some of the notation. The R number is like a serial number for regular maps. The number before the dot is the genus, and the number after is a unique identifier. And this is a Schlafi symbol. The first number is the number of sides of each polygon, always three for triangles. The second number is the number of faces that meet at each vertex. And the subscript is the length of the graph's Petri polygon, which isn't really super important for this. You might also want to consider which geometric symmetries can be realized in the embeddings. Since a regular map is so symmetric, it typically has hundreds of symmetries, but we can't cram all of them into the 3D space of the polyhedron. But then, which symmetries can be embedded for a given regular map? This is where my journey started with Dr. Bukowski. In 2017, he found an embedding for the Genus 7 Hurwitz map, or McBeath surface. But it didn't have any geometric symmetries. So he wanted to know if my method could find a symmetric embedding. Well, with only a few changes to my code from before, I gave my solver the new map, and in a few hours, I found this embedding with C2 symmetry. I guess I'll also quickly explain some of the Schurenflies notation. The C stands for chiral symmetry, the most familiar one. It's a repeated symmetry around an axis. D is a dihedral symmetry, which is like a chiral symmetry plus another 180 degree symmetry on a perpendicular axis. S is like a chiral symmetry plus an inversion through a central point. And these last letters are symmetries of some of the platonic solids, which are special products of the other symmetries. Many of these symmetries include smaller subgroups too, so I won't include any subgroup if they're already covered by a bigger symmetry. Okay, back to the Hurwitz map. This new symmetry was already a noteworthy discovery, and Dr. Bukowski and I started working on a paper about it together. But I wasn't really satisfied yet, because I didn't feel like I had done very much. So I decided to try the next regular map in the Hurwitz sequence. This one was much larger with genus 14. But after a couple days, I was able to find a symmetric embedding, the first ever embedding for this map. So now I'm thinking, I bet I could find a lot more of these. But to not spend forever on this problem and actually get the paper published, I decided to focus on the hyperbolic, regular triangle maps up to genus 14. And there's 14 of those. Some of these already had known embeddings and symmetries, but here's all the new ones that I found.
So this chart went from having only a handful of examples to now having embeddings for almost every map of genus 14 or less. The only exception was R13.2, which empirically I'm confident doesn't have an embedding, but I can't prove that using my method. One other interesting thing is that some of these embeddings have the same geometric symmetries as a platonic solid, the tetrahedron, which are known as Leonardo polyhedra, since some of the others in the group resemble drawings made by Leonardo da Vinci. And I didn't even talk about the duels. There was one known already, and due to the algorithm I'm using, duels of triangle maps are just as simple to solve as the originals, but they do tend to be less likely to have solutions. Still, I ended up finding five new embeddings, each with different symmetries. Obviously, the shapes can be difficult to understand from watching the video, so I created a web page where you can interact with them or download the models if you want to explore them more or try to 3D print them. I also published the source code on my GitHub, so you too could be the first to discover some new embeddings. I included most maps up to genus 100, so there's a lot I haven't even looked at yet. I did try a few though. My favorite one, I think, is this R17.1 duel, which has octahedral symmetry. This was my first time writing any kind of academic paper, and there's no way I could have done this without the help of Dr. Bukowski, so I'm very thankful for that. And of course, this also means I technically have an Erdosh number now which is the degrees of co-authorship away from the famous traveling mathematician, Paul Erdos. And my number is three. Not bad. Anyway, there's not too much else I wanted to say. The links to the paper and everything I've talked about are in the description. Thanks for watching.